morning, all of you Highlanders out there. Go ahead and stand to your feet, say hi to everyone. And happy Palm Sunday. this morning. Here we go. Ten. came in this house to praise his name but let's be honest how many of you came into this house and you've got some things in life that are kind of hard to face right now so that means you're in the right place because praise breaks the chain of the things that try to drag you down amen now some of you came in just now and you found your seat because you thought you could avoid the hug You got 15 seconds to do a love blitz in this house. Hug everyone you can that's around you. Go ahead. Shout to the Lord, come on! 
cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise. Praise cause you're sovereign. Praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. cardio more. Amen. How many of you know our God is good? Thank you, Father. Glory to you, Lamb of God. Oh, you are so holy. Glory to you. What a joy to worship you. You traded riches and you run to my rescue oh my
good question. How many of you believe that God is good? Who really believes that God is good? Who really believes He's good? Oh, no other one so glorious. Jesus
I'll never stop running to Even when I don't understand Trust your word, Jesus. I trust you. Holy Spirit, this morning in this house, we welcome you with all of our hearts. Break chains. Set those captive completely free. Heal bodies that are hurting and broken. Change our thinking to look like yours. And Lord, we declare as one body that as we move forward from this day on until we see you face to face, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Healing, deliverance, salvation, victory, overcoming in the name of Jesus. And it's in that amazing and awesome name all of God's people said, amen. Give him a hand clap of praise today. Hallelujah, you are worthy. Before our sound, media, and lighting crew shares an extremely special Palm Sunday greeting with you, Pastor and I want to personally say, last Sunday was one of the most monumental times of our lives. One of the most humbling things that we've ever experienced. One of the most powerful things that we've ever experienced. The unity of the body of Jesus Christ. So beautiful. I don't think we could even begin to put into words the strength that we felt from your love and your prayers and your encouragement. There are truly no words. And if we had time, we would wash every one of your feet. We love you so dearly, and thank you so much. And my feet are still waterlogged, and I love every bit of it. <laughs> and I will say that what you guys did, I'm going to mention it in the message today when I speak, but what you guys did opened up my heart to something that the Lord's been trying to pour into me that broke the chain on something that was trying to kill me. And so I praise God for your obedience, and I thank God that you took the time to do that. We don't take it lightly. We take it as family in the body of Christ. And how many of you know that one day we are going to stand in heaven together, perfected, praising God with all our might? So thank you for staying the course and strengthening us so we can do the same. We love you. Watch this video.
was pretty awesome, huh? Let's give those kids a huge round of applause. And we want to thank Pastor Amy for everything that she does for the kids' church. I don't think people realize how much time and effort she puts into this. I mean, it's hours upon hours every week. So thanks to her and the team. And with that, we still need a lot of volunteers for VBS coming up in July. So please see out front, there's a sign-up sheet for that. And we still need teachers as well and subs for our kids. So please, please, if you have a heart for kids, if you have kids in our kids' church, please step up and help. Otherwise, we couldn't continue to keep doing these amazing things that they get to do. With that, our kids are dismissed for today. So we'll let them step out. And we're going to step into tithes. So as they're headed out, let's just prepare our hearts to receive our tithes and offerings today. So Father God, we thank you so much that we can come here today, especially on Palm Sunday, and acknowledge what you did all those years ago for us, that you came in glory and beauty into the city of Jerusalem, knowing in a week what you were going to be facing. Knowing that the people there before you we're praising you and loving you and honoring you. And in the same week, they would turn their backs on you. And Father, because of that, we're so thankful that you continued to follow through that path with your son, that you didn't turn back, that you let him go to that cross for us, to bear those burdens for us, to bear our sins for us, so that we could enjoy heaven on earth. And with that, Father God, I just pray that we joyfully and intentionally and biblically come before you to give our tithes as just a small, meager offering back to all the goodness that you bring us, Father. So with that, in your holy name we pray, please come up and give your tithes and your offerings at the buckets right here in the front. this week, who has had answered prayer this week? Raise your hands. Who's had big answered prayers this week? If you had, clap your hands and praise Jesus. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Our God is good, and if you have prayers on your hearts and needs, remember your answered prayer is coming in his perfect timing, in his perfect will. But this morning, we want to lift up particularly uh, Angie Kilpatrick. Uh, she has been, her and her husband have been sick on and off, and she truly wanted to be here this Sunday, but she woke up with a migraine, uh, a lot of neck pain. She's got some uh, screws and things in her neck, and, uh, and suddenly her elbow isn't working very well. 
So we want to immediately pray for her right now as she is at home. So in the name of Jesus, we just pray over Angie from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet that, Father God, you touch her through your power of your Holy Spirit, through the blood on that cross, that her body will be healed, be made whole. That pain will be gone in the name of Jesus. That migraine will be gone in the name of Jesus. Movement will come back to that elbow in the name of Jesus and that she will be able to rejoice you wholly and beautifully today from home and that, Lord, she will be back here again. So we lift this up to you now, and Father, for all the other burdens that we are carrying today, we just pray in the name of Jesus that we are able to truly lay them at your feet and give them to you, Father, and trust in you that you will answer them in perfect timing, perfect will. And we're so honored and thankful and privileged that we can come before you with these prayers and trust you in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we've got some quick announcements. Please do remember next week, this week is Holy Week. And uh, Pastor Jason will be speaking Wednesday at noon at the Methodist Church that's right next to Pizza Hut. It's an awesome service to be a part of. And if you can go daily, all the churches in the community uh, gather to be a part of this. And it's just a beautiful thing to just be able to go and worship and hear the word with the rest of the community. You also get lunch every day. Um, so please do try to make it every day, but definitely on Wednesday, we would love to see you there for Pastor Jason. Um, and then also Wednesday night, it's going to be a special treat. We'll be listening to The Passion or watching The Passion movie here. And again, if you haven't watched it, I've heard people say, it's. I just think it's going to be too hard to watch. Watch it anyways. If you have friends and family, bring them. This is a powerful movie, and it's a perfect time to watch it this time of year. So please do come Wednesday night and be a part of that with us. Um, and then also, um, just a reminder today that we have Sheila Walker's memorial service at 2 o'clock. We'd like to request that if you're not staying for the funeral, we'd love for you to fellowship. Just don't fellowship too long out here because we want to make room for everybody that's coming for the funeral after service. And also, we did open up the back driveway to the church. So with the amount of traffic that we're gonna have coming in and out today, please feel free to use that back driveway. You can just head on right out to that back road and uh, make room for everybody else that's coming in. And um, I just have to say, thank God for heaven. Thank God for, can you imagine what she's experiencing up there today? I just, I, my mom's up there and I think about it all the time of, this is why Jesus came not just for heaven on earth, but no matter what we go through down here, we have his promise of paradise in eternity. We can't begin to fathom how beautiful that is, but thank God he came to the cross and did what he did so that we have that promise. So with that, do we have any new guests today by chance? I know it's always embarrassing to raise your hand. Awesome. Welcome, welcome, Joe. We're so glad you're here. Is there anybody else here today? I know it's embarrassing, but if there is, just put up a little finger. <laughs> All right, just Joe today. Hey, Joe, we are so glad to have you here. We're very, very thankful. And uh, we're looking forward to next Sunday to even have more. So Easter Sunday is a big Sunday. Bring families, bring friends. But as of today, we're going to hear a wonderful word from Pastor Jason. In the city of Jerusalem, whispers of anticipation are heard everywhere. The streets are alive with the news of the imminent arrival of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus sends two of his disciples to fetch a donkey and its colt. He rides into Jerusalem, fulfilling what was foretold by the prophet Zechariah. As Jesus enters the city, a large crowd gathers to greet him spreading their cloaks and palm branches on the road in a display of honor and reverence. The atmosphere is one of celebration. This is Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, the embodiment of hope and salvation for a weary world. The people cheer. They shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And whether they know it or not, as Jesus passes by them, they are witnessing the face of God in the humanity of this man on this borrowed donkey. This Easter, you're invited to discover the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to experience the overwhelming gift of grace yeah. and salvation that's being offered through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. 
Amen. Stand on your feet, everybody. Well, good morning. Who's alive, awake, and excited about Jesus? If you are born again and not afraid to get loud about it, feel free right now. Go for it. <laughs> Amen. Stay standing for just a moment, and I'm going to ask Miss Deborah Smeeds, would you come right down here? We're going to gather around her. She and her family are moving to Pikeville, so this is their last service with us today. Just gather right here, and everybody squeeze in around them, and let's love on them as we pray over them today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for these mighty women of God. Strengthen their lives as they go. And we thank you, Father, for the time that you've allowed them to be here with us. Lord, we pray for the grace, power, anointing, purpose, and love of God to pour into them, pour through them, go before them, and make a way. As they enter Pikeville, Father, let their feet be destined for good things. Direct their steps, and we rebuke every work of the enemy that would try to come against them. We thank you that grace and favor is already doing the work to get them exactly where they need to be. We praise you, Father, for their time with us. And it's in Jesus' name, all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. We love you. You're the greatest. Thank you. Come here. You've taught me more. Lord, I love you. God's good. Yes, he is. Amen. <clears throat> well, church, it is Palm Sunday. Everybody say, Hosanna. There was so much when it comes to days like this that, you know, you think about what you want to share, how you want to share it. And I want to share some key things within the text of Mark chapter 11. Um, but I also want to say that I feel like there has been a time that we have had to push through heavy seasons. How many of you have felt that a lot over the last few months? But there's a lifting that's beginning to happen. In the spirit, there is something unique that is happening. And it's not just a feeling. It's that something is lifting because prayers have gone forth and seasons are tough. How many of you know sometimes it rains real hard and it's sloppy and nasty? But when the flowers bloom, you can kind of get excited because of that rain that came. And sometimes we have a tendency to only stare at the problem instead of the promise that God is taking us to. Something can last and persist for so long that it feels like God has abandoned us when in actuality, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But I will tell you this, even though he will never leave us, never forsake us, sometimes walking through the problem can make us feel like the promise is not sure. But God says, I'm not a man that I should lie. So in other words, God's got something for you. And sometimes to get where he's calling you to, you have to go through seasons that look just like the desert. I don't know about you, but I like a nice hot day occasionally. There's a reason I go to the beach and then come home. Maybe we should just start Highlands Bahamas and we'll make a trip. Amen. But I'm ready for the vision of the church to begin to truly grow like never before. I'm ready to go and do what we've never done, step into the hard things and see the greatest fruit we've ever seen before. I'm not talking about just bodies and seats. I mean the sick being healed in public, right? People being born again at Walmart, the post office, at Subway. The kingdom invading to such a degree that your joy comes up, heaven gets loud, the enemy gets mad, and Jesus gets all the glory. But it's a choice that has to be made. It's not a feeling. It's not something that a pastor can pump you up to do. Because as soon as we say amen, pump will last and fail. But if it's down on the inside of you, everybody just take your hands, put them right here on your stomach and say, down in my knower. See, every single one of us has certain things, revelations about God that are so ingrained and down in us that nobody can move us from them. I'm a firm believer that God is good. I'm a firm believer that his will is wholeness, healing, victory, overcoming power. So what do we do when the world around us doesn't mirror what we know firmly? And the word is, we stand. We stand on every promise of God. Notice he calls them promises, not problems, right? Now, I've been pastoring this church for 17 years. That's a long time. And I believe that we're about to enter into the greatest days that we have ever known as a church. Not for our glory, not for some name on the door, but for the name above every name. But that means one body has to unite together. That means serving, giving of your time. 
And after last Sunday, I was overwhelmed with the calls that we got in the text talking about how many people signed up to serve, how many people signed up to bless and be a help. I really believe that those keys, those moments are things that are going to propel this church into the next season. I'm a dreamer. I never stop dreaming. I dream big. I dream loud. I walk around this place and talk it out loud and speak it out loud. And I believe that God wants to do something massive, but we have to also balance this. Sometimes we can have a tendency to base the vision of God upon the amount of people in a building. And that's a travesty. One of the greatest sins that David ever sinned, God said, not just Bathsheba, but when he numbered Israel, saying we are this strong because we have this many people. What God was trying to show David is that you need to stop looking at the number of people in the seats and look at the number that heaven sees because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is bigger than what we're doing in here today. But I do believe that a church that teaches the finished work of Christ and mobilizes, imparts, activates, and sends forth believers will be a church that can never contain the amount of people coming into the building. Services, I can see it, where people are sitting down on the floor because we just don't have enough seats and that's okay. That they're coming in, getting filled, stirred, increased. I lay hands on every one of these warehouses saying, God, if it's your will someday, let that be a Bible college. Lord, if it is your will, make that the sanctuary of the, of the church. And over here, we'll make this kids' church. And over there, we'll make that into a, a, homeless, a, a homeless staying and, and food and all of these wonderful things. Nothing's impossible with him who believes. But if we don't choose to lean into the word and become disciples of Christ, what God says is possible will seem impossible to us. Turn to your neighbor and say, your biggest problem is yourself. And if you were already mad at your neighbor, we just got made that worse, I think. That's, that's okay. But I want to show you something today in Mark chapter 11, starting at verse 1. Entering triumphantly, triumphantly into your destiny in Christ. Verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem of Bethphage and Bethany, the word is actually pronounced Bet Pagi and Bet Hani. Pagi or Pagi fruit is a fig in Israel. Bet Hani means the most fruitful place or house of figs. So he's entering into this place. We know that Mary and Martha and Lazarus live there. When they drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. He says to them, go into the village opposite you. And as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. How many of you know that a donkey or a horse that's never been sat on is not always the kindest of animals? <laughs> but somehow this one was calm. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. Look up here. Almost like Jesus knew what he was talking about. Amen. And they loosed it. Watch this. But some of those who stood there said to them, what are you doing? Pause right here. Loosing that colt. The year was 2007. Pastor Jason, what are you doing starting a church in Jamestown? I had so many people say those words. It's funny to me that God has a desire, a design, and a plan for your life and will give a word of command and a mandate to send you forth. But the enemy, through people, will always try to cause you to question what you're doing and make you think it's wrong. They go and loose the cult because Jesus said so. Jesus also knew that people would fight it, so he said, when they say that, tell them the Lord has need of it. There's situations that you and I face every single day that we need to stop giving in to pitiful opinion and start yielding to what Jesus said. When the enemy comes to you and says, you're never going to be healed, you need to pause right in that moment of unbelief. Look right in the face of hell itself and say, excuse me, the Lord has need of me. Healing is mine, not because I feel it, but because he said it. 
And greater is he that's in me than he that is in this world. What are you doing loosing that cult? Watch this. They spoke to them just as Jesus, pause here, had commanded. So they let them go. I would dare say that every single person sitting in this room has had times where what you knew was biblical to do was questioned in your heart and mind. The thing you knew to do came with a question behind it because of storm, because of circumstance. Maybe it's marriage. Maybe you've struggled in your marriage. You know what God says about it, but it seems like that person you're married to isn't lining up. Some of you just laughed. If you're married, put your hand up. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask hard questions. But sometimes we can have a tendency to, to think that if God will just fix them, just, Lord, fix her. Just notice I'm looking out here. That's what we think sometimes in our hearts. If they could, God, if you could just fix that, just fix this. And she's thinking, Lord, fix him. Amen. <laughs> Fix him, Lord. How about this one? Here's the height of pride. Lord, you and I are good. I need you to fix them. And the Lord's going to go, right, because you and I are good, you should have the wisdom of heaven to know to be patient as I'm working on them just like I'm working on you. Oh. But they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, and so they let the donkey go. This colt, this foal of a donkey was taken. Not a war horse, but a humble, lowly donkey. Now watch. Everyone was expecting Jesus to come in like thunder, like a lion. He comes in like a lamb, which is proof of something you and I need to understand. The situations you face do not need the force of your personality and emotion. They need the lowliness and humility of the finished work of Jesus, which is more powerful than anything the enemy will ever try to do. But that means you've got to harness your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your vision, and say, God, I choose to believe what you say. What I feel doesn't look like that, but what I feel is temporary, and that's eternal. We're often saying, Hosanna, which means God save us, or save us please. We're saying, Hosanna, God fix my current situation when God is really going, actually, first I need to fix your eternal situation. God, make me feel better. How many of you like to feel good? I'll tell you what had been happening in my life for the last two and a half, almost three months. I, uh, you know, you go through the seasons, came out of Christmas time, and I got a little bit of a sinus infection, infection that was going on, and I chose to use a neti pot. You guys ever seen those? I got a neti pot, and um, I used to do a thing where I'd take golden seal root in it, and you strain it, and it's all golden. You pour it in your nose, and your head goes into a revival, and you blow stuff out that looks like the devil. Well, this time when I poured it in, I grabbed my nose, and I kind of pushed pressure, and it shot into my ears. And the infection went down into my neck. And it started crossing through my head. And that night, I, I, I sat up. And this isn't a pity party. I just want you to know the story. I sat up in a chair trying to sleep. And for about five hours, I was in the most excruciating pain, realizing that I had put something somewhere that it wasn't supposed to be. So I thought, okay, the pain went away. And I got moving a little bit. And every single day, it started getting worse and worse and worse. Like my head was underwater. And I would be in the pulpit here preaching and sometimes looking at the scriptures and they'd start to spin and my head was doing this and every night sleeping a couple of hours and waking up trying to do some things. I put in antibiotics, put steroids, nothing made a dent. And so worry started to creep in. Not worry like woe is me, but Lord, I know that you've called me to do something. And I made the mistake of doing this. Sometimes we think that God can set us free from the stuff the enemy does, but we don't think he can fix what we make the mistake in. And there I sat, and it was just last week, I was walking in the sanctuary, and I said, God, I know that you've purposed us for something bigger than this, and there's no way that the enemy is going to get a foothold and take me out, because it got to the point where I couldn't even function. I would drive down the road and feel like I was going to pull off the road, and it just kept getting worse. 
Then finally the Lord stopped me and he said, did I not walk in your bedroom in 1997 and tell you to trust me? I said, yes, Lord, you did. He said, then stop worrying. Speak my word and pray. Well, then Sunday comes and you guys have the glorious nerve to wash our feet and make me cry like a madman. <laughs> Hallelujah. And as I'm sitting there weeping, the Lord said, don't you understand? Because what happens when you're not feeling well, it can make you feel like the world is caving in on you alone. When you guys did what you did, not only did it stir my vision for what's to come, but it reminded me of what God said. And I remember leaving here, going home just exhausted, and saying, Lord, no matter what, even in the moments where complaint comes out, I'm going to trust your word that you're strong enough, you're big enough. And I laid down two nights ago and I said, God, this is not only in your hands, but it's in my mouth. I started speaking that living word of healing and I slept like a baby. Got up feeling better than I felt in months and months and months. Laid down again last night speaking that word. Got up feeling like a racehorse ready to run. And I said, God, your word works. And he said, help yourself next time you face the storm. Don't wait till you're at your worst before you decide to choose my best. In this moment, what you see here, the disciples are in obedience to Jesus, but humanity doesn't understand. Let me go ahead and let the cat out of the bag and set you free from something. No one will ever understand why you truly do what you do in Christ. No one. No one will understand why you lift your hands. I remember the day I got saved. I walked into church and watched people lifting their hands and looking up. I walked in thinking, who are they looking at and where is he? I didn't understand. But once I came to the Lord and got to know his word and got to know him personally, it makes perfect sense. Rochelle and I have a language. She can look at me and say nothing and I understand her. It's because time in relationship has produced this place. No one would ever understand our communication because it's ours. And you have that exact connection with your Lord Jesus Christ. As the bride of Christ, he is the husband. You are one. When that relationship is cultivated, let me tell you the first fruits of that cultivated relationship. It's pure joy. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you feel like you had more joy the day you got saved than you do right now, it means you've actually walked away from the depth of relationship that he's called you to. And sometimes you replace it with ministry and religion. Great biblical knowledge will never trump the simple, humble position of loving Jesus and him loving you. And that is the place of greatest victory. Watch this. They spoke to them just as Jesus commanded. Then they brought the cult to Jesus. Go ahead, verse 7 and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their clothes on the road. Pause right here. Others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now, often when we read this because we see videos, it has a tendency to have great fanfare. But I need you in your mind's eye to go with me to Jerusalem. This was during the time of Passover, right? There were so many millions of people there. This was not actually something unique. People would often take their clothes when kings, sometimes even priests, would ride into the city. So they were doing what some other people may have been doing in another part of the city. Palm branches were not unique for the day because people did that during the time of Passover normally. So something we see as this unique moment that we think is so grand was actually very simple with little fanfare. How do we know that? Israel was under Roman occupation. If it had been something like a conquering king, Rome would not have had it. They would have said, time out, put that man in jail. But what Jesus did did not throw them. That means what he did was understood and under the radar. This is the thing we got to understand about our Lord Jesus Christ. He's so good at what he does that he knows how to, under the radar, get into your life. Under the radar, get into your mind. Under the radar, through people, speak things into you that you didn't realize God was trying to get in there. Think about your very life soul from this day back to the day you were born, and you can see the timeline 
of how Jesus was hunting you down with love. And Jesus doesn't chase down what he doesn't love. Under the radar, he's coming in going, whoo, I'm going to get you, Timmy. Amen? Under the radar. Jesus showing up going, I'm going to start searching their heart and life. I remember myself in Nashville. God starts working on me. At my lowest point, I start looking up. Let me share something with you as a side note today. Never lose the wonder of the beginnings of your walk with God. Never lose the place where he means more to you than this. He is everything. He's the reason you praise. He's the reason you sing. He's the reason you're here. You read his word because you want to know more about him. You praise his name because he's worthy of it. But don't lose the beginnings or those things simply become activities and actions. He says this, and many spread their clothes on the road. Others cut them down or cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Watch this. And those who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna. This word Hosanna means save, please. Now watch. When they made this statement and they made this cry, we know that because of the heaviness of the Roman occupation, that the Israelites were saying, God, save us from the Romans. God, remove the bondage and the burden of the enemy around us. It's the same thing we do today. God, save us from the heavy oppression of the enemy. God, save us from the Biden administration. <laughs> that was like a grenade. Some went, can I laugh? Anyway. <clears throat> Now, they were saying this. They're saying, God, save us. Lord, save us. Even most of the disciples that were shouting for Jesus were hoping that he would come in like thunder. They were hoping he would ride in, and they're thinking to themselves, this is the day. Imagine Jesus gathering with the 12. He looks at them. He says, hey, boys, come here. And they all gather around him, and he says, it's time. And they're like, Whew. it's time, Lord. It's time. Oh, we're going to conquer? Mm-hmm. We're going in big time. And they're like, oh, yeah. I can imagine Peter and Andrew going, oh, 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 oh. Right? And John's over there like, Rain Man, yeah, we're definitely going to go in. Yeah, definitely. And Peter's going, I'm going to cut somebody's ears off. They were ready. They thought the war was on. They were sure that this was it. Everything that they had hoped for, now it's time to conquer Rome. And Jesus looks at him and says, bring me that donkey. <laughs> Throws his leg over that bad boy. Look. And he says, let's go. <laughs> For some reason in my mind, I hear him going, boom ba dee da boom ba dee da <laughs> He rides in, right? The disciples were there. They're cutting down palm branches, and they're like, Jesus is coming. It's time for the conquering king. Hosanna! You had to know there was somebody there going, I thought it would be louder. Why would God do this? You know you're the Savior. Why don't you just go ahead and wipe out the thing that is burdening me? So often we're saying, God, fix the problem, when God is saying, actually, I'm going to make you strong in it, so that when you face it again, it will never hold the weight in your life that it does right now. The things that you have faced from the moment you were born that you thought you couldn't overcome, let me let you in on a secret. You're still breathing. When the enemy came to you and said, I'm going to wipe you out and you will never fulfill your destiny, that's when you need to look at Satan and go, I'm alive today, cat. I still have a destiny. God still purposed me and called me. God still anointed me for the kingdom of God in this earth. God can't back away from me. He can't forsake me. He can't lie to me. God gave me a promise. And because he gave me a promise, 
I am now Satan's problem. He comes and he says, I'm going to wipe you out. Sometimes you need to look at the enemy and go, dude, you, you really need to stop talking. Because I've been through enough to know that anytime you start, it means you're scared. And anything you say is a lie. All you're doing is shoring up the promise to me. And every time you fight, I'm only going to get stronger. Hosanna. Save now or save please. They're thinking he's coming in like a conquering king. And he comes in lowly riding on a donkey. Which is what Zechariah 9 says. Now, there would have been some there that knew the Word of God, that knew the Torah, that knew what was being spoken, and they would have said, this is fulfilling something. Watch. Notice that Jesus said, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of my Father. He said, I'm here to fulfill all things. So Jesus' heart and mind was not even on the people shouting. He wasn't on the, the loudness and the dustiness and the chaos of the day. Passover was coming. People were coming to gather for the feast. His mind was on one thing, fulfilling. Watch. Which is why Jesus was not moved from his purpose. Everybody take a deep breath. Go with me in your mind's eye. Jesus is on his donkey. And he's just riding. And I imagine him with complete peace, not coming in with his chest puffed up, looking around angry. He came in with simple, humble peace. The palm branches are there. The clothing is being laid down. He sees it. He understands it. He knows it. But he refuses to allow what the people do to move him from his direction. So he takes a deep breath and he rides in. The whole time knowing, he hears them singing Hosanna. And Jesus is saying, Yeshua to Yahweh, fulfilling Father. How about your situation? What if you decided, just like Jesus, to come in in humility? Instead of strapping your legs over your problem, you come in humble. Lowly and simple, resting with a deep breath, saying, I'm not here to worry about my problem. I'm not here to worry about a thing. I'm here to walk in the fulfillment of what my Father called me to, and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I don't have to be moved by what the people say or don't say. I don't have to be shaken by the enemy and all the lies he throws at me, but I will rest and fulfill my days in my Father. Every single person in this room desires one thing, in each day, above all else, peace. We want peace. We work hard and gain finances and do things so we can secure peace. We mow our three-foot-high grass so we can have mental peace, <laughs> right? Sometimes we'll even avoid conflict so we can have peace. Sometimes we'll even avoid the word so we can have peace. Sometimes we can be in such a situation that God is calling us to the Word and we know it because we're hurt, offended, mad, down, sick, frustrated. We avoid the very thing that produces peace because we don't want to change. Like I said, God, fix him, fix her, fix him. And God is going, listen, if you're going to call out Hosanna, you better be ready for me to save the way I'm coming in to save. You better be ready for the change that comes, and it starts on the inside. And repentance is not always pretty. Sometimes it's ugly, and it's full of stuff falling out of your face, tears out of your eyes. You find yourself for days going, Lord, I can't believe that I allowed my life down that road. And the Lord goes, hey, I haven't left you. I'm not forsaking you. You're feeling this way because I'm calling you into a place of holiness that is going to produce heaven on earth. Stop fighting the incoming king and start submitting to him. Like I said, there was nothing unique here. 
we'll often shout Hosanna just like them because we want freedom from our current situation, the Romans. What Jesus came to give was freedom from the eternal situation that was stealing not only your soul, but your mind. We want God to save us from discomfort. We want God to save us from our bad feelings and our bad moments. We want God to save us. And the truth is, at Calvary, Jesus said the word, Mashalem, it is finished. And he saved you. The question is, do you know it? What did he save you from? What chains has he broken off your life? What areas has he set you free from your captivity? Have you forgotten about it? Have you forgotten what you were in and what he brought you into? Have you forgotten what it felt like when you were down and out? Have you forgotten what life itself was like when God was not operating in your existence? Have you forgotten the detriment, the degradation, and the depression that you were under in heaviness? Have you forgotten? One of the greatest ways to get very excited about God is to remember what he brought you out of. Jesus even said this, in this world you will have trouble. Jesus isn't here to remove your Rome. He's to make you strong in it. He said, I'll be with you in trial and trouble. Well, God, I just want everything to look and feel just right. And the Lord says, actually, I want you to rejoice like it's right, even when you're in the midst of it, Paul. I want you to praise me when you're in the prison. I want you to shout when they put you on that cross. I want you to rejoice when they beat you. They crucified Peter upside down. A lot of people don't realize that's where the peace sign came from. He did not come in with fanfare. But the unique thing is this. Watch what happens next. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now watch. Jesus went into Jerusalem and into the temple. But get ready. So when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Wait a second. You ride in for the triumphant entry? You get off the donkey, walk into the temple, look around, then look at the disciples and go, let's go home. What? They expected him to come in and say, here we go, boys, overturn some tables. We're going to knock this thing out and take it all back. They were hoping for hype. Instead, they got humility, almost boredom. Your faith is tested in the seasons that are not exciting, but sometimes when it's the most boring. Your faith is found when things don't feel just right, but you know the word is right. Jesus walks into the temple, looks around, and then turns around and goes home. Why would you do that, Jesus? This was the most simple of days. Yet he's fulfilling the word. What it says to me is this. Jesus who left, the same Jesus who's coming back. The one who ascended to the Father, don't be mad because he put the Holy Spirit inside of you and Jesus is coming back to claim what belongs to him. But when the hype isn't there, Jesus goes back to Bethany and I guarantee you, the disciples were looking at each other on the way going, that was different. I thought this would be more... Uh... Imagine Peter going, I didn't get to cut anybody's ears off. <laughs> Man. It didn't look like what they thought it should. But if we're being honest, how many of you can say that most of the time when Jesus does something in your life, it doesn't look like what you think it should? When he breaks that chain in your life and you finally realize it was him, you go, God, it didn't look like what I thought it was going to look like. When you were saying, God, I need this job, and you didn't get that job, then God directed your steps and gave you the job you needed. 
God, do you really want us to move back to Tennessee? God, what are we doing, Lord? I love what Mr. Brandt said to us one day at the staff meeting. He said, it's funny how God's been working in our lives. We have this heart to serve people. And he said, when I came to Highlands, I didn't even like people. God's good. He changes hearts. But he does it under the radar. It's this little trickle. When I was a kid, I remember my sister and my mother, um, when we'd travel down to South Georgia to see my grandmother. How many of you remember the uh, station wagons from 1980? Remember they had the back-facing seat? That was my seat. There was no AC back there. The seats were made of toxic vinyl. You would lose weight in the back of that bad boy going to South Georgia. I had a dachshund, which is a wiener dog, right next to me. Even the dog was looking at me going, and I'm in the back just dripping, right? And my mom, my mom would say, Jace, come up here and scratch my back. I said, okay. And my mom had a tradition. She loved to get a RC Cola or a Tab. You remember Tab? And she put peanuts in it. Yeah, that was her thing. And that was when we, my dad thought that using the AC would use too much fuel, so the windows were down for seven hours. Everyone had a very odd sunburn on one part of their leg because my mother would stick her leg out the window. And she'd say, come up here and scratch my back. I said, okay. I'd crawl over my sister, and if I touched my sister, she'd slap me. So already, I'm on my way to bless my mother. I've been smacked twice by my sister. The dog doesn't know what to do because it's a roasting hot dog in the back of the car. And my mom would say, scratch my back. I had a problem that I would lose focus, so I would grab her back and I would just scratch in the same spot. And my mom would move around over here. And then she'd move over here and she said, honey, honey, stop. I'm like, what? She goes, I'm bleeding. Just that same little thing, right? Everybody say the same spot. Situations in your life, sometimes the enemy comes in and just wears you down. It's that same spot. You're just going, I'm stuck. You notice that discomfort makes you do things? Anybody? How many of you ever had poison ivy? You ever had discomfort from poison ivy? You're sitting there going, I'm not going to scratch. I'm going to scratch. And you just lose it. <laughs> Distractions of all kinds come around, and there's this discomfort that comes into our lives, and we don't like the moments where God is trying to bring change. But remember something. He's a father who loves you so much. And he says, hey, if you won't listen to my direction, I'll shift situations and opportunities to draw you into my direction. It's not always fun, but it's because he loves. Yes. By the way, never ever say that I'm saying that God is the author of sickness. Because people try to use a message just like that and go, that's right. God put cancer on time out. Uh -uh. Can cancer exist in heaven? then it's not God's will on earth. So we'll keep standing upon that word and speaking that creative word until we see these things change. My chain broke when I cried Hosanna. But I want to I wanna bring you into the understanding of this simple situation here. Jesus goes in lowly, no fanfare, not as a conquering king, but a healing savior. He gets off the donkey, goes into the temple, People are back there wondering what he's going to do, his disciples. The whole city was in an uproar anyway because it was Passover. Everyone was mad at Rome. There's emotions all over the place. But Jesus is focused on doing the will of his Father. He goes in the temple, looks around, turns to the twelve and says, let's go to Bethany. So they retreated to Bethany in simplicity. Not what they were expecting. I will remind you of this. Even in the things that you're facing right now, that you may feel have a timeline or God must answer by this moment. Remember, though Jesus left the city, he did return and he is still the same Savior. That's right. Jesus didn't stop being Jesus. Just because you don't feel something doesn't mean that God has lost his power. Just because you haven't seen the thing that was prophesied over you yet doesn't mean that God has let you down. We live in a generation that has been so tuned and sensitized to the moment instead of looking at the promise above their problem. We have an instant fast food mentality 
And God is saying, you have to break that off of your life because all it will produce inside of you is frustration, impatience, questions of all kinds. If you want peace in your days, you must completely surrender to the author of the day. See, today is Sunday. Amen? I just thought I'd share that. It's Sunday. It's a day to be thankful. It's a day to be grateful. It's a day to stop clamoring and reaching and toiling over what you don't have or do have. It's a day to quit worrying about all the chaos. Today at 2 p.m., we get to honor and remember our sister in the Lord, yes. Sheila Walker, yes. Chris's mom. Now, I have to be honest, I keep thinking about her standing in heaven rejoicing in the Lord. I also get a little bit worried about the things my dad is probably telling her. <laughs> but one day we will stand there face to face. That began to hit me, actually. I began to think about the reality that one day we will stand before him. Great joy filled me. I mean, I'm not talking about a little bit of joy. Tears began to flow and praises began to come out. And I realized a key. One of the things that keeps you strengthened as you walk through the earth is knowing that God has not, he is, not only has he not abandoned you, but prepared a place for you. When you know where you're going, earth isn't a problem. But when you don't know where you're headed, this life is terrifying. But Sheila rejoices today. She's dancing whole, no sickness. She's praising God with all of her might. Imagine what her house looks like. Imagine what my dad's house looks like. My dad, seriously, is probably in cut-off shorts with old shoes on and a T-shirt because all he wanted was a little house, a fire pit, and a chair. I don't know if the Lord gave him that, but if I go up there and I see a, a fire pit, I'm going to be like, there's dad. There's a reason to rejoice. There's a reason to praise God. Have you not seen the things that God told you would come? If you haven't, hang on. Don't get offended, don't get bitter, don't get mad, don't church hop, don't complain. It's the government's fault. No, it's not. No, it's not the government's fault. It's not your past fault. It's not this fault. In this world, you will have trouble. The enemy is a liar. Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly. Walk with him. If you don't like the way the kingdoms of this world are going, remember, he has a kingdom of which there is no end. Yes. It's time that we become a people who are thankful for what we have. Thankful. Be faithful with little. He will make you faithful with much. Developing a heart of thankfulness. Lastly today, I want to take you into the timeline of Jesus as he leaves Jerusalem and is headed to Bethany. This is our king who conquered sin and death. But sometimes we forget that as he was headed to Bethany, he had something on his mind. You guys can play something. He had you on his mind. He had me on his mind. But let's be honest. We know from the garden when he cried out to his father that he also had death on his mind. I saved this for last for a reason. I think when Jesus was riding on that donkey, he was saying, I'm going to fulfill everything you called me to, knowing what the final fulfillment would take. That's why he had to keep his eye on his dad. He gets off the donkey, goes in, looks around the temple. And inside he's thinking, stay the course. He turns around and leaves. They wanted Jesus to be a certain way. But you don't realize that Jesus said, I'm coming in the way my father tells me to come in. He's going back to Bethany. His heart probably heavy he's looking at the 12 he's concerned for them 
He hears the echoes in his ears of the people shouting, Hosanna. God, save us, save us, please. And inside he's going, I'm going to. But I have to get to Calvary to do it. Jesus knew with every step he took to Bethany that he was going to see faces that loved him. He's going to see Lazarus. He's going to see Martha busy. He's going to see Mary in there going, hey, Jesus, how did it go? Sometimes we try to make everything so biblical that we forget the reality that he went into a house of people that cared about him. It was honest. It was real. It was raw. Imagine Lazarus going, hey, what'd they say? Can you imagine the conversations that Jesus and Lazarus had with people when they went out into the city? People came up to Lazarus, hey, weren't you dead? <laughs> Lazarus has probably shared it a billion times. He's like, oh yeah, old hat. He, he rose me up. It's all good. Getting some bread or whatever they do. But I imagine Jesus walking into that house and looking at Lazarus, and Lazarus knew his best friend. He probably went, is it now? And Jesus is going, imagine Lazarus going, Whew. it's not in the Bible, but I wonder if he pulled Jesus aside and said, what's going to happen now? And Jesus probably went, it's all right, bud. Are you okay, Jesus? Yeah. I also wonder if Lazarus said, I wish I could fix this. And Jesus went, that's my job. Lord, there's people still outside yelling, Hosanna. I know. They just don't realize that the thing they're shouting with joy is the thing that I'm going to bring to them, but I have to go through pain to do it. I wonder how many times Jesus stopped and simply said, Father, I need you to help me. Bring these down a little bit for me, Cody. Everybody likes the story of the triumphant entry. It has great fanfare. But sometimes we forget that his triumphant entry was one of the hardest steps of his life because he knew that that was the moment that things were sealed that sent him into his final days. He took a deep breath knowing that he had about a week knowing that this was the season of the Passover and everything was about to change. And when you know your death is coming, you have a tendency to stare at things a little longer, to smell the smells deeper, to find the green in every tree, the red, the purple, the blue in every flower. You have a tendency to look at the clouds and feel the breeze and smell the air. And I wonder if Jesus looked around at his disciples and saw them and smelled them. Sometimes human beings, when we know that there's something coming, we have a tendency to even cross over into humor sometimes because our thoughts can go to a heavy place. I wonder if Jesus did that. He had a meal with his friends. He gathered together. He washed their feet. He loved them to the end. And then slowly and surely, he makes his way to his final place, his final destination on earth, which is Calvary. This Wednesday night, we're going to be showing the passion of the Christ. It is going to be a beautiful, epic, and even hard time. Because no other movie to date showcases the depth of what Jesus went through. But it always ends with victory.
when it has anything to do with Jesus. But I wonder today, I wonder how many of you are in that place in your life where you say Hosanna with great gusto because everything's going good. But I wonder how many of you sitting in these seats today are in a spot where Hosanna is hard to release because the situation you have faced persisted for so long or is still persisting. You find yourself going, God, I want to be something. I want to do something. I want my life to be more than it is right now. And I just don't know how to do it. God, I want to get my hands in it. I want to do it this way because the timeline that you have doesn't match my heart right now. Hosanna, Son of God, save me, please. That's what Hosanna really means. Hosanna is begging the Father. Hosanna is apart from self. It's a cry from the heart that says, I can't do it anymore. I've got to have you. When's the last time you cried out to God like that? When's the last time your heart went, Hosanna! And if it's never come out of your mouth, you've never known what it means to be without his presence. Some of you have a dream that's so much bigger than anything you can create by your own hands, which is proof God put it there. God will never put a dream in you that you can handle by your own strength. He will never put a dream inside of you that your abilities can conjure. He would never do that. Because if that's the dream God gave you, then you can give yourself all the glory for completing it. The reason God does it like this is because God says, number one, when you know that it's bigger than you, you cry out to God, Hosanna, which gives him entrance to do his will through you. And you get the joy, just like the Garden of Eden, of walking with God in the cool of the day. Hosanna. Save me, please. Hosanna. God, save. God, appoint me. God, strengthen me. Dawson, stand to your feet, sir. Lift your hands high. I need to get some folks behind him quickly. The Lord says to you, I've heard your cry. And I've seen your tears. I know what you long for. And the Lord says, don't be afraid. And don't put a timeline on me. Your timeline is not based upon the people around you or the culture that you walk in. I've taken your steps in many directions, but the Lord says, I'm about to hone them because your heart has chased after me. Have expectation that I will do mighty things through you. But the number one thing I desire with you is time. So come away with me. Yes. Let me speak into you the things that I need to. I'm preparing you amongst your generation for the work of the Lord. So don't be afraid. And then at times you say, Lord, I'm tied at the tongue. The Lord says, I will loose your mouth yes. with the sounds of heaven to speak what I've called you to speak. So don't be afraid. When the thoughts come of fear, replace them with praise. When the thoughts come of doubt, speak my word. Yes. Be bold in me, yet be humble. For I am the Lord who appoints you. You do not have to fear. Fear has tried to grip you. Fear has tried to steal hope from you. It is a lie from the enemy. You will be where you are supposed to be right on time, says the Lord. So trust. Things shift now. In the name of Jesus, I give you praise, Father, for that anointing flowing through that man of God. I thank you for your presence and power made manifest to him and his days to come. In Jesus' name. Church, would you stand with me? <laughs> Quickly, I want to ask this. Keep playing. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Let me just ask it like this. 
If you feel like you have it all together, then you don't. If you feel like you can handle it by your strength, you don't. If you feel like you're the one who doesn't need the help, you're the one who does. If you find yourself saying, Pastor, I don't feel close to my Lord like I used to. I've lost that simple place of my first love. I remember the early days when it was joy walking with him and simple. Let your heart cry Hosanna again. Triumphantly enter into your destiny in Christ by making him your all. Jesus is the conquering king, but he did it through a cross. And he says to you and I, through the ages, take up your cross and follow me. Every life that is worth its salt in Christ, that does anything for his name, will first come to a cross. I look out across this congregation of saints, of people who love the Lord, and I see people who care about him, who love one another, but I also see people who are broken, who hurt, who have questions, fears, and doubts. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's something to remedy. And I feel like God is restoring people back to their first love more than ever before. He's preparing the bride and calling that bride to turn their face back to the husband once again. Today, if you're in this place and you say, Pastor, I am a born again believer, but my Hosanna from my lips has been quiet for a long time. If you've been carrying care, burden, fear, anxiety, stress, worry about the days to come, if you've been bound in your heart because of temporal things such as money, I want you right now in Jesus' name to come stand at this altar with me today. Come on. Amen. Don't be afraid of the altar. It's a place where things come to die. Don't be afraid of your destiny. Don't be afraid of the next place. Don't be ashamed of stepping forward. Today, your walk to this altar is saying, Hosanna, God save me. Hosanna, save me please. Hosanna, get into the mix of my life. Hosanna, step into my storm and command it, peace be still. Hosanna, Lord, save me from myself. Saints, come stand with these who have come. Don't be afraid. This is the day that the Lord has made, and it's time to rejoice and be glad in it. He stepped into your existence to call you out. And if you feel discomfort, if you feel uncomfortable lately, if it feels like nothing seems to make sense and things just don't seem to go the way you thought they would, rejoice anyway. He walked into your temple and he is at rest at the right hand of the Father. And he sent the Holy Spirit and put him in you to give you a voice and a mouth to speak that living word over every situation you face. Remember, anything God puts together, the enemy will always fight. Don't stare at the battle. Stare at the victor and the victory. Today is a day that peace floods your soul because the burden you've carried questions about what to be, how to be it, when, what will I do, will I be a success? And the Lord says, yes, you already are. Healing is yours. Deliverance is yours. Peace is yours. Grace he gives so freely. Mercy to your heart and soul. Today is the day that you take the deep breath down not from your lungs but your very spirit and you declare to him Hosanna in the highest you haven't abandoned me you won't let me down you're not just seeing me through the storm you're taking me to higher places in your name you've got plans you've got businesses you've got destiny you've got purpose you've got children you've got marriage you've got it all God 
in store for my life. So today I rest in you. Because you have ridden into my chaos. You've walked into my temple. And then you went to the most fruitful place, which is heaven, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And you have sent Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and put him inside me. Greater is he that's in me than any enemy that is in this world. No weapon formed against me shall ever prosper. My future is blessed. My present makes sense. And my past is forgiven. The Bible says these words. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is Palm Sunday, and we no longer wave palm branches. We wave holy hands to the Lord our God. We no longer lay our clothes down. We lay our lives down. And we say, King of kings, come in. Conquering king riding lowly and humble. How righteous and perfect are you. You who has made my heart your home. You who has blessed my days. You who has forgiven my past, appointed my destiny from this day forward. You who already sees the door you have for me that I don't even know is coming. You who has met with me and made me your home. You're the one I praise. Hosanna in the highest. Look right here, church. This isn't cheerleading. This is prophesying. His word makes a declaration for you, about you, and around you. It is a destiny that he has appointed you to that you don't have to fear. The early church knew it like this because they wrote about it. They talked about how once Christ has come, the future and its fear has lost its grip. I'm not talking about a religious theory. I'm talking about an awareness of the presence of God that makes tomorrow lose its strength of fear. The only time you have the ability or choose to fear about the days that haven't come is when you're not trusting about the one and in the one who has them. Hosanna is saying, I'm aware of your presence, and the substance of your presence with me gives my present moment peace. That is why you can leave this house today, walk into this amazing city that God has blessed us to live in. You can eat your food with peace and bless those around you. You can go to your home with a smile and love your children and enjoy the sunshine that he has given you. You can pet your dog and thank the Lord for every time that little tail wags. And if you get home and you see a donkey, just remember this. Boom ba dee da boom ba dee da. Happy trails to you. He did the work. So it's time for us to start enjoying it. I'm not talking about a life void of trouble. He said in this world you will have trouble, but he never said you had to be moved by it. Choose joy. Choose peace and choose his love. Link arms all across the sanctuary. Get close. If you are a first time guest, we hope you'll be a second time. But throughout our town, they've called us many names over the years. They've called us the Kissing Church. We still don't know what that's about, so don't worry. They call us the Hugging Church, and I'll take that all day long. But recently, I heard them call this place the Healing Church. Then I heard them call it the Believing Church. Then I heard them call it the Grace Church. I'm like, yeah, just keep it coming. What I want to hear people say is, that's a church that's all about Jesus. There is no name above his name. He is not the one who just saves. He is salvation. He's not just the Savior that heals. He is healing. And the moment that revelation settles down in our hearts, 
great joy fills our lives. So it's Sunday. Holy Week is upon us. I get the honor of teaching this Wednesday, but the brand new pastor at the Methodist Church is going to speak tomorrow. Yeah. Brother Harris, on Tuesday, we have Josh Grubbs. Yeah. On Wednesday, myself. On Thursday, I believe it's the Presbyterian Church. And then Friday, Friday is Alive in the Spirit. Yep. And so every day there's going to be speaking, worship, and uh, it's a record because I always speak 15 minutes long. That's it. It's a miracle. <laughs> Come see a miracle. But there's always fellowship. There's always food. It's always good. And so I hope that you will take the time this week to focus on what truly matters. Take every day. Turn your cell phone off if you're able. Take time away from the things that distract. Breathe in the air. Look at the sun. Well, not at the sun. We'll... Towards the sun. Not directly. I believe we have a solar eclipse, and I won't get into the book of Zechariah too much. But um, there's some things that are happening that are completely biblical. So I believe we're a generation that could possibly see his return. And until that moment, let's keep praising God like he's showing up in five minutes. Amen. Let's go. Father, we thank you for your love, your mercy. Thank you for this day. Thank you for every life that has come to Highlands today and all the saints of this city who have gathered in your name. We pray blessing on all of the churches, Father. Stir unity in our hearts so that your kingdom may go out and your name may be known, that this good news can be preached to all. In the name of Jesus, we declare and even prophesy to our city that addiction is breaking and fleeing our city. We declare over marriages blessing and more blessing, unity and covenant. We declare over our city that that spirit of poverty is being dealt with through the Word of God and blessing will flow. Lord, let it be a land, as the Word says, of milk and honey, that all across this earth people will come to this area to know you, to draw into you, and experience your presence. I give you thanks for your goodness. Thank you for healing us. And today we declare Hosanna in the highest. In Jesus' name, all of God's people said, amen. amen. Give somebody a big old hug. If you're a first-time guest, Rochelle and I would love to meet you right over here. As I said, at 2 o'clock today, we will have the memorial for Miss Sheila. You are welcome to come back for that. God bless you. Remember, this Wednesday night, we'll go right into the film, Passion of the Christ, 6 p.m. God bless you. Thank you.